So I said in the previous video that uh, threads cause some problems. Actually, threads are created in order to solve a certain problem. But when they run, like we saw with the operating system scheduler, they cause various other problems. And so we have solutions that allow those problems to be overcome. But those those solutions cause yet further question problems. And uh, so we go on and on and on, basically for three levels until we... So that's why threads are fairly complicated. So the first thing that we have to um, solve is um, satisfied by the join method. So if T is a thread object whose thread is currently executing, and so we have another T1 or T2 that's also executing, T.join causes the current thread to pause until T's, T's thread terminates. So if T.join causes T1, let's say, or T2 to, to pause, until T finishes executing, and then T1 or T2 can, can proceed. So join is dependent on the operating system for timing, and so we should not assume that join will wait as exactly as long as you specify. So join also responds to an interrupt by executing, ex exiting with an interrupted exception. So you, there are several down in the, in the yellow um, highlight. You can see that there are several overloaded versions of join. So here's a, a, a set of code. It's not that complicated, but it's a little difficult to follow. So first of all, there's a message root loop that implements runnable. So inside the run method is this important info. Mares eat oats, doze eat oats, and little lambs eat ivy, a kiddly divey too. That's a poem my mother used to tell me about when I was a little toddler. That was a couple of years ago. Um, so this run method loops through, uh, calls the thread message, and with important info and sleeps for four seconds approximately and then prints out the message. So notice over in the right hand column, the driver, uh, if T is alive, it doesn't have a try catch because it has a throws interrupted exception at the main level. Um, so if interrupted exception happens, it'll uh, it'll bomb. So as long as T is alive, T dot is alive, then the message prints out is still still waiting, and then we join for a thousand seconds, thousand milliseconds. Now, this current time millis minus start time, this part here, is one hour. If it's greater than one hour, then we're then we're tired of waiting, so we throw the t dot interrupt and we bomb out the program. Um, so let's see how that works. Um, we're waiting, then we're still waiting, and notice there are five here, although it's four seconds. Then there's mares eat oats, and there's three uh, calls to thread message. And now, and then the, th the third line, or the second line, does eat oats, and that's four lines, and little lambs eat ivy, and kittle eat ivy too, and, and we're finally done. So that's how join works. Now, the purpose for threads is to implement concurrency. One purpose. The other purpose is to give the uh, the idea that we're running faster than we really are. 
but um, concurrency helps us uh, by sharing resources with several threads. So when two threads share a common resource, they can conflict with each other. So let's say we have this uh, deposit runnable that uh, on bank account that uh, is going to deposit a certain amount of money. And then we're going to sleep for a certain amount of time. Delay is probably a thousand milliseconds. And if we get interrupted, then it throws an interrupted exception. And then there's a withdrawal runnable that's similar. So obviously, if you went to the bank, if my wife went to the bank in L.A. and I went to the bank in San Francisco, and we tro both tried to withdraw $1,000 out of our $1,500 checking account, um, if we had fit that much money, uh, there would be some problem. If the bank was foolish, it would let us both withdraw $1,000 and we'd have more than the, than the bank held in our account. So the same idea is true of withdrawal runnable and, and deposit runnable. So here's a bank account object. We're going to deposit $100 and withdraw $100. And uh, we're going to print the messages. So normally, the top part of this slide shows what it's supposed to look like. You deposit $100, and the new, new balance is $100. You withdraw $100, the new balance is zero. But if occasionally, um, there'll be some incorrect output like this. And that's because the thread timed out in the middle. So in this example, the deposit thread starts, ex starts executing and it executes depositing so much amount. And then the balance variable is still zero when new balance gets, gets set to the amount, which is 100. But then the deposit thread reaches its own time, reaches the end of its time slice, and the withdraw thread gains control. And the withdraw thread calls withdraw, which is withdraws $100 from the balance variable, which is still zero. So now it's $100, not good. And then the withdraw thread goes to sleep. So the deposit thread picks up uh, where it uh, left off, and the balance is now 100 instead of zero because the deposit method used the old balance. So this is approximately a, as close to a synchronization diagram um, for another type of diagram from UML. Um, and it kind of shows what is going on there. So this is basically a race condition. If, if the uh, effect of multiple threads on a shared data depends on the order in which they're scheduled, then it's possible for one thread to race ahead of the other one and get ownership of that, of that uh, resource in the middle of a statement. Now, computers, especially the language, language Java and other fourth generation programming languages disassemble themselves or into into assembly language I don't shouldn't say disassemble but they they create assembly language and which in turn creates machine language and there are very precise um, executions that are not as general as the as the deposit method or or even the the, the plus sign um, so if it if if that happens then uh, the race condition can occur and basically a race condition is two threads racing to get to the same resource so here's deposit runnable making periodic bank accounts deposits 
and here's withdraw runnable withdrawing and uh, here's the driver and the the bank account has a balance that can be changed by them and so we have some some messed up output so how do we synchronize that well here's an example of another a second example of how we introduce new features new constructs to prevent certain bad conditions from happening so to prevent a race condition we use a lock object a lock object is just one um, it's just an, another kind of object now we can have object locks and class locks an object lock locks us out of using multiple threads on the same lot on the same object whereas a class lock uh, locks us out of using the same uh, same thread or different thread on the same class we are going to talk about the object locks so there's the definition of them both now in Java you have an interface called lock and a class the most commonly used one is reentrant lock I don't know what reentrant stands for but but that's what it's that's the name of the class so reentrant lock implements lock and uh, that's what we use generally to lock a, a an object so how do we do that well first of all we we typically uh, add it to the class whose method it, accesses shared resources shared resources so if bank account accesses uh, calls deposit and it calls withdraw we could create a, a variable called balance change lock and we name it so that we can understand what it meant and it is a an instance of lock and then when we when we create balance change lock we created as a as a reentrant lock because lock itself is an interface so this balance change lock has two methods primarily it has a lot of others but these are the two that we use lock and unlock so we manipulate we we lock a resource and then we manipulate it and then we say unlock so we have a problem here um, because if something happens in between lock and unlock to throw an exception then the call to unlock never happens and we never get to the unlocking but here's a here's an example of how deposit might implement lock so we remember we had we define balance change lock outside in the bank account class. We call lock on bank on balance change lock, and then we do our business, and then we put it put unlock in a finally clause because it will always happen, uh, regardless of whether we throw an exception or not. So when a thread calls lock owns the lock until it calls unlock that's pretty standard pretty basic so if another thread calls lock if a thread calls lock while another thread owns it then the the lock is temporarily deactivated and the thread is temporarily deactivated and this thread scheduler periodically reactivates it so it can try to acquire the lock and eventually it will try to acquire the it will acquire the lock so again here's balance change lock why do we put it outside um, if we had two balance account bank account objects you would have two separate lock because one bank account shouldn't influence the amount of money in another bank account so
So if we omit the call and lock, then nothing, it continues, deposit continues to have lock, uh, lock the object and it never changes the bank account. Okay, so I mentioned that um, we had problems that were solved and those solutions caused other problems and those solutions caused other problems. So another problem that's caused is deadlock. So we have uh, this example, withdraw calls a lock and then it, now it's gonna wait for the balance to grow. But it, it's got the lock on the, on the amount. And so um, it, it can't ever get to unlock. So we can't just call sleep because the thread will block all other threads that want to use balance change lock. And so we, no other thread can successfully execute deposit until um, withdraw exits. But withdraw exits doesn't exit until it has funds available and therefore we have deadlock. Now I, I used to drive up to uh, George Mason and uh, there's a certain intersection where the they block the box all the traffic the cross traffic blocks the box all the time and so i couldn't proceed because there were cars blocking the box and if they looped around and looped around behind me um, they would never unblock the box and so that would be an example of deadlock it didn't happen all the time and it didn't happen forever. But here's an example. If we've used locks, we have the potential of having deadlock. And when deadlock basically happens when one thread can't proceed until the other thread exits and the other thread can't proceed until the first thread exits. So to overcome that, we have what's called a condition object. So a condition object allows a thread to temporarily release the lock and regain it later. So a condition object belongs to a specific lock object. So here's a, um, we had this lock object, balance change lock, and then condition is sufficient funds condition. So if it's sufficient funds, condition is returns a condition class condition that is called by new condition but it's called on balance change lock so we want to name these these locks and these conditions so that we understand in our coding what they mean But now, so here's the here's what you might put on a condition object. So we we have this uh, sufficient functions condition, and it has this method called a wait. So let's see how that works. If you call a wait, it makes the current thread wait, and allows another thread to acquire the lock object temporarily. So to unblock, another thread has to execute signal all. So here's the method that sufficient funds condition on the other thread has to execute signal all. You could say signal, but it, we tend to say signal all because we it unblocks all the threads. We don't have to randomly pick just one. So here's how this would work. Um, this is the runner, the driver. It starts both threads. And bank account starts with a zero balance and it creates the balance change lock and the sufficient funds condition, which comes from the balance change lock. Um, it uh, deposit, tries to deposit and it puts the lock on, but it, in case it hasn't deposited enough, it 
the sufficient funds condition called signal all. So here's the withdrawal method, and it awaits until, which basically means that while balance is less than the amount that's being deposited, um, it temporarily releases control back to the deposit method, so the deposit method could actually deposit more money into the balance. But then when the deposit method calls signal all, then a wait stops waiting and it goes back and checks again. So in this case, it works just fine. So the difference between call and sleep and await is that sleep just gets reactivated when the sleep delay is passed. And a waiting thread is only reactivated if another thread is called signal all or signal. 